I structure my day so that my mornings now are a time when I'm able to focus on certain things for me that in the past, I would kind of dive right into work and then have other ideas throughout the day that would distract me and I would kind of get pulled away and go down a rabbit hole of something else. And instead, starting off with, okay, you know, if I know that I'm, when my brain is kind of going with ideas, I need to allow myself that space in the morning, whether it's through free writing or just kind of free planning and thinking about whatever it is that's just on my mind when I wake up. And when I write things down and get things out of my brain, it doesn't kind of jumble around in there throughout the day. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 218 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyotsuka.com. If you're a regular listener, you likely know about my signature program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. We call it A-OK for short. This is the program that I built off of my patented cartography system to help ADHD women figure out what they should do with their life. ADHD is completely misnamed. We know this, right? We don't have a deficit of attention. We have a surplus of attention. We're interested in so much, which often means that we struggle with trying to figure out which of the many interests that we do have is actually the one that we should pursue. With AOK, we start from the inside out and we figure out who you really are. What's important to you? What is it that you value? What are your strengths, passions, superpowers, and purpose? Which is really what you should build your life around, right? I mean, who cares where you fit in? You're not meant to fit in. You're meant to stand out. And that's exactly what we do in AOK. We learn where and how to stand out. So AOK includes live office hours and coaching with me, a community, the AOK system, worksheets. You'll create your own AOK intelligence report, which you'll be able to refer to for the rest of your life. And the thing about AOK is it's a lot of fun. It is so much fun learning about ourselves right? We've wondered for years why we do what we do, why we feel the way we feel. Well, I'm going to show you why in AOK. So one of our students said this about AOK. Thank you so much for helping me see my potential and gain more confidence in making decisions about how I want to live my life. After endless sessions with psychiatrists and psychologists throughout the years, No one, and she put that in big, bold caps, has ever come close to what this program has to offer. And just so you know, this quote is from Ava Katrin Segura Dottier, who is a medical doctor. So we're going to start on Tuesday, March 14th 
We'll have our first office hours on Wednesday, March 15th, and our office hours are every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We're going to try something different this year, and we're going to be going through our normal six-step AOK program, but we've added a two-week implementation period, so the program will actually run eight weeks. So if you sign up with the code SPRING2023, you'll get $100 off of your ADHD brain is a okay until the program is full. You can find more information at tracyoutsuga.com forward slash a okay. And don't forget to use the code SPRING2023. I would love to have you join us. So now let's get on to our podcast. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, not one. So that means I am just delighted to introduce you to Micah Clasper Torch today. Micah Clasper Torch is an artist, fashion designer, and the founder of Punch Needle World. Her limited edition collections and custom pieces are centered around the traditional craft of punch needle rug hooking and have been displayed in galleries and featured in various print and online publications, including Cole Magazine, Molly Makes, Love Embroidery, and Rug Hooking Magazine. In true ADHD fashion, she has had a winding career path that began with getting her BFA from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City and led her to a variety of work across the realms of art, fashion, and startups. In 2017, she discovered Punch needle rug hooking, and it sent her down a rabbit hole that she has yet to emerge from. In 2018, she debuted her punch needle coat, which combined her background in fashion design with this little-known art form and propelled her to the forefront of the craft's resurgence. After completing her studies at the Oxford Rug Hooking School in Vermont in 2019, she launched Punch Needle World with a mission to uplift the craft celebrate its rich history, and make high-quality supplies and training accessible to all. She is passionate about teaching this technique to others and has taught punch needle to thousands of students around the world through her online courses at Domestica and Punch Needle Academy. Micah currently lives in Los Angeles with her partner, Harrison, and their doodle daughter, Miso. Welcome, Micah. Did I get all that right? Uh, Yes, you did. Thanks, Tracy. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. So a doodle daughter. So what <laughs> kind of doodle is this? Miso is a golden doodle. She is just two years old, uh, two and a half now, and very sweet. Definitely gets a lot of attention. So uh, very much uh, a dog mom over here. How, how old was she when she was finally potty trained? Oh, you know, she was really good from from the early days that we brought her home. It took only a couple times of of kind of saying no and bringing her right outside when she went. And she was potty trained pretty quickly. I think it only took a couple weeks after we brought her home and we brought her home around nine weeks. So Ugh. that part was easy. <laughs> but uh, the jerking and the barking and the biting <laughs> was all Oh, no, she's a barker. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my she gosh. She was, but no longer. I think we... Uh, my partner Harrison is very good with training her. So. Okay, we're going to have to talk about that after because yeah. <laughs> as our listeners probably know, I have a golden doodle. He is going to be six months, I think on Saturday uh-huh. or Sunday. He's still not potty trained. And I thought, oh, a golden doodle. You know, he'll totally be potty trained within the first couple of weeks because my golden retrievers, both of them were. And he's yeah. not. So, oh, no. Oh, that's still so hard. Present. It's not bad. It's like usually once a day, number two. But still, yeah. that's gross, right? <laughs> yep. Well, number two was definitely took a little longer for that one <laughs> to get, get, get trained. So <laughs> they no, really are is. such great dogs, though. Yeah, I just he's very just sweet. A character, Micah. Before we talk about punch needle rug hooking and what that is, can we talk about your ADHD diagnosis first? Yeah. So I was diagnosed with ADHD in last summer, so July of 2022, and I was 35 years old, and it was completely unexpected. And it's kind of an interesting, you know, way that that happened because it actually was 
on the recommendation of my partner, Harrison, that I look into this. He had actually been exploring the potential of him having ADHD after learning that it runs in families and knowing that he has some family members with ADHD and starting to recognize some possible traits in himself. As he was starting the process of looking into that, he started seeing a lot of things that seemed very familiar to him in relation to me. And so he brought it up to me at one point and kind of broached the subject of, you know, I've been looking into this, but I've been recognizing a lot of these, um, you know, symptoms of ADHD uh, in you. And have you ever thought that you might have ADHD? I mean, I had never crossed my mind. And I think that there was probably a previous version of myself that would have almost been like offended at the suggestion because growing up, I, I just knew very little about it. And I think I had that impression growing up in like the 90s and early 2000s that ADHD was a very like disruptive behavior. And, you know, it kind of meant like a problem child who couldn't sit still and would run around the classroom. But it was interesting him him bringing it up. You know, he mentioned some things that it just really began to resonate with me. And so I started to do some research of my own and look into it and, you know, filled out questionnaires online and started to um, just draw these connections that all these habits and kind of things from my past and childhood that I had just thought were quirks and totally unique to me. All of a sudden, it seemed that everything <laughs> was actually a symptom of ADHD. And eventually I chatted with my doctor about it and she referred me to someone who could diagnose me. And after conversations with her and filling out some other forms, she did diagnose me with a combination uh, inattentive and hyperactive ADHD. So once you knew it was ADHD and you had the benefit of all this hindsight, what are some of the symptoms that you had always wondered about, but now you recognize them as, duh, that was my ADHD? Yeah, you know, yeah, it was really interesting because I think the biggest thing that I recognized was things that I had done that were actually coping mechanisms. So, well, first and foremost, I'll I'll back up. When Harrison had brought up the idea of having ADHD um, to me, the big one that he mentioned uh, was time blindness. I, though I've been working on it, I have been chronically late all the time in my life and. The ability to kind of uh, estimate how long things will take me to be able to stop what I'm doing and and break from what I'm doing in a timely manner to get out the door on time is definitely something that I've struggled with. And another big one that that was brought up from him was also transitions. And that was something that became super apparent during COVID when we were both working from home. When I get into flow with something or my work and something I'm really passionate about, it's incredibly hard for me to be pulled out of it. Even if I know, oh, here's the time we need to stop or, um, you know, it's time for dinner. It's time to go to this place. If I'm in the middle of something, it becomes almost painful to uh, switch gears. And okay. when I didn't have, you know, a commute or a transition or something to, you know, allow me to transition myself mentally, I couldn't just like, I can't just shut my laptop and then be present in a new space. It takes me a while to unwind. So those two were were major ones that have also certainly been present throughout my life. But looking back, some of the things that I recognized, ironically, one thing that I used to think was an indicator of why I could not possibly have ADHD actually <laughs> is... <laughs> Um, a total indicator of ADHD, and that was largely that I would, um, I was a voracious reader when I was young, um, and you know I would say, oh, I remember literally saying to someone in like middle school or high school, well, I couldn't have ADHD because I have no problem concentrating. In fact, when I sit down to read a book, I don't even hear my parents talking to me. They can and say my name. And I'm I'm responding to them, and you know. A, a constant kind of refrain was like, Micah, we've called your name to come to dinner so many times, you know, and we're all sitting around the table and I'm and I look up and I'm I'm like, what? This is the first time I'm hearing you. I have no idea that you've been calling me. And I would like respond and be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I have no idea. And in, in fact, that type of hyper focus, now looking back, I see that the things that, you know, where that would happen for me was just such an indicator. Among many other things of, I mean, everything from the way that I would organize my notes for school and kind of my reliance on to-do lists and planners. Um, again, these kind of coping mechanisms that I put in place that I realize now in hindsight were there to support what otherwise would have been a struggle for me. Um, how, did, I, how did you organize your notes in school? Yeah, so I had this very elaborate system of using colored markers, and I would actually carry around like a pack of Crayola thin mm. markers, and different subjects had different colors, and I would have to write the headers in different colors. Um, it was like mildly OCD, um, where but it was like how I would stay focused in subjects in particular that were boring to me. So things like math or history, things with a lot of facts or memorization, if I organized my notes in this way that felt creative and visual and kind of captured my attention, it was a lot easier to concentrate. And then also when I would go back to study, it was easier for me to kind of see where I needed to focus. But it took me, you know, it was it was not very efficient in terms of like it would take me so much longer than other people to be taking notes and I would rewrite them. And if I didn't like the way that it looked, I would do it. Like kind of OCD, like, and I thought it was just a quirk of mine and it worked for me, you know, it, it helped me. But now I see that that really was this way of kind of gamifying things that I found boring. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I did the exact same thing. Well, honestly, I don't think I really learned how to study until law school. Yeah. I, I'm not really sure how I got through before, before law school, but I yeah. did the same thing. I mean, I look at my my law books now and it is just crazy they are highlighted they have yeah. tabs in them they have little red notes and then i would have a notebook that would be all color coordinated like yours that would go with that particular textbook and then from the notebook i would then highlight that was the last step after all the color coding yes. and i would put it on three by five cards and that is the process i had to get through and people they would always take my notes, right? Because they were yeah. so organized. And then they would study the night before and they would do better than I did. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Which is so frustrating. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think it's so interesting hearing you say that you did something similar, you know, with the notes. And, and I think that um, what I really recognize when I began learning about this and listening to your podcast and just hearing stories of other women and individuals with, ADHD, like harder we make things for ourselves and how much longer it will take us to, to do this, you know, and, and that was certainly present in my my childhood and high school. I was always uh, the last to finish tests. And in fact, luckily, I went to a very supportive um, school. It was a it was a private school. My, my father was a teacher at the school. So I went there from K through 12th grade. Um, the classes were small. There was a lot of personalized attention. And I really think that made a big difference in me kind of not struggling with this in in other ways, because, you know, I would be taking a math test and the teacher would stay with me 20 minutes after the class as I was finishing, you know, until finally they'd be like, Micah, I got to go home. You got to wrap this up, you know, um, and that wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't fly in other schools, I'm sure. So Looking back, I really see that the support from the school and then from my family also just being flexible with encouraging me to pursue my passions and um, not putting pressure on me to succeed, you know, in certain ways in in areas that might not have been my strengths. I, I really credit that with supporting me in my younger years and also why that diagnosis was definitely overlooked. <laughs> hmm. So were you a good student? Did you get good grades? Was school easy? I just asked you three yeah. questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Answer any one yeah. of them. Yes, totally. Yeah, I do think that I was a good student. Growing up, you know, I always on the report cards that I got when I was younger, it was definitely like, Micah needs to stop chatting with her friends. Like when she's <laughs> more interested in talking to her friends than listening to class. Like, So that was definitely the feedback when I was younger. And but I, I liked school. You know, I liked being around my friends. I 
the subjects that I was less interested in, again, I would kind of come up with these ways. By the time I got to high school, I had kind of developed these ways to try to keep myself engaged. You know, the subjects that I was less interested in, I tended to get, you know, maybe B to A minus. Um, and then I, you know, I did well in the subjects I was interested in, like English, kind of the humanities. So yeah, I never really thought too hard about it. And I also, I knew that I was interested in art and design and wanted to go to art school. So I didn't kind of beat myself up too much about um, other subjects. I think that I just, um, I didn't really care about being good at things that I wasn't interested in. And I, I didn't put a lot of pressure on myself based on what other expectations, you know, outside expectations. Um, and because my family was supportive, I don't, you know, I didn't feel yeah. that pressure from anywhere else. So I think that really helped. Well, that's just another example of how important it is as parents, right? That we yeah. really support what our kids' gifts are and, you know, make it yes. real clear to them that, look, let's not focus on our weaknesses. You know, not yeah. everybody's going to be good at math and science, even though society seems to think those are the um, only important subjects. Yeah. So... How did you do the first year? Did you go to college? Did you tell? Yes, you went to um, FITM, right? Yes. Yeah, I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology, FIT in New York City. And how did that go? That was great. So you actually moved to New York City. Where, are you, where were you living? Where did yes, you grow I up? Grew up in, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, oh, so not too far. Beautiful place. Yeah, it was great. And I considered going to RISD. I think my parents hoped that I might stay closer to home or consider it. But of course, I was really intent on getting out and going to New York. Of course. Um, and I mean, I loved college. I loved my experience at FIT. And really, I mean, when I think about it, New York City, I mean, what better place for <laughs> for me, for someone with, with ADHD, someone who there was so much to do. And it was like the world was open to me to make my own decisions and my own choices. And I was studying something that I was actually interested in. And I threw myself into it. And, you know, it just being allowed to focus on the things that I was passionate about, I think has really, again, helped me throughout my life and probably is what led to this being something that wasn't diagnosed until later and maybe would have even been missed by me completely if it wasn't for Harrison. Yeah, I had a great time in school. I I really enjoyed my classes. I, again, love that it was so practical and hands-on. I was learning to make things. I was learning to drape um, on a dress form and to sew and making something from nothing. And to me, I was like, I can't believe that this is school. I get to go to school and I get to like make things all day. So I think it might have been a different story if I had gone to a different school. But um, I really, you know, feel that having been allowed to pursue that passion in that way allowed me to kind of like dive in and um, kind of play to my strengths. Uh, so and enjoy. you were basically <laughs> in your creative and likely around a ton of other neurodivergent brains. So you were in your in your right environment. Yes, absolutely. Just and, and so much stimulation, you know, interesting people. Um, that the worlds of art and design. And then there really wasn't a big campus life at FIT, at, you know, pretty immediately. You're just you go to classes, but the rest of the time you're just living in New York. So, yeah, it was different than other friends, college experiences who might have gone to a more traditional campus. But I found that so fun. You know, I got to I did internships from my first year. Um, I was always kind of finding other ways to learn stay stimulated and going out in the city um, and just, yeah, I had a blast. <laughs> it sounds like it. So what has changed since you were diagnosed? Um, so since my diagnosis, it a lot has changed, really. And I didn't expect that to happen. Um, well, I didn't expect the diagnosis at all. So I think that first it was a bit of a shock. And I think it led to a lot of introspection and kind of looking at my life and everything from my past, things that I mentioned, you know, realizing there were certain maybe coping mechanisms I had put into place down to habits like I, you know, have bit my nails over my life at various times. I talk with my hands, very expressive. And, you know, I always saw these as, oh, um, 
you know, I'm part Italian. So of course I talk with my hands. I'm like, my dad bites his nails. And so like, you know, that's, that's where I get that from. And it was a little bit of a feeling of like, do, how well do I actually know myself? So I think at first it was, it was a bit of a shock, but also pretty immediately one of the things I was really surprised to feel was also this relief. And in reading about ADHD, in listening to your podcast, in hearing the stories of of people who um, had ADHD and kind of naming that and discussing their symptoms and experience, I found I felt connected and I felt a community that I had not even realized that was out there or that I was was missing. And that was a new feeling for me, you know, because I, I've been someone throughout my life who I kind of shy away from like labels or groups. And I, I kind of like to stand alone and do my own thing. And I don't really like, you know, I'm kind of like, well, if someone wants to know about me, they can ask. Like, I don't want to, you know, assign myself to any kind of group or label. And that had always previously felt uncomfortable to me. But for something like this, saying I have ADHD and realizing that there are people who this isn't, I'm not on my own dealing with this stuff. I'm not this person that no one understands and and I, I'm dealing with all this stuff in this way that is you know completely foreign to anyone else. I just found so much reassurance in that. And that, and that surprised me, I think, that I felt that sense of community and belonging was really powerful. So that, can I that ask, has, yeah. Can I ask you, Micah, had you always felt different than others? Mm. Yes, definitely. And, you know, I think just the way I like to talk about things and I'm always having ideas and my brain's going a mile a minute and some of the closest people in my life and some friends are are different than that. And obviously I have friends who also are similar, but I think that, you know, I I didn't always feel like I knew a lot of people like me, or at least I, I didn't think I did. And so it just, that was a big shift for me. And it just led to a lot of introspection and, you know, conversations with my family when I shared with them the diagnosis, which was, I think, a little bit hard for them to comprehend at first, I think because they probably had the same idea that I had that, you know, this was something that was only present in people who were really struggling or it was a really disruptive kind of behavior. And um, and that wasn't the case for me. And I think because they've seen me as independent and, and successful in my life that um, I think that was hard for them to understand. But since has just been really wonderful and I think just led to us being closer and kind of discussing things from my past and childhood with that. And and it's also led to a better relationship and communication with my partner, Harrison, who also was diagnosed with ADHD. So <laughs> being in a couple with, with, uh, who are both diagnosed with, with ADHD, it presents in slightly different ways for each of us. I think it's done a lot for us in terms of just better understanding certain behaviors or habits or ways of communicating or things that we need, um, everything from my transitions, uh, you know, the space that I need to transition from work into, you know, coming home after work, the time blindness thing um, and other just ways of communicating. So it's been really, I mean, so many things. It's It's been pretty transformative, um, I have to say. Yeah. And it sounds like ultimately, although there was a bit of shock at the beginning, it's been a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has. Um, it's definitely been a good thing. And it it's led to differences in my business, um, the way I approach my schedule, uh, my work habits, just the more I understand about myself and the way my brain works. And I can kind of see it truly as, um, oh, this is just my brain. How can I, you know, set my day or my schedule um, to kind of play into that instead of fighting against it? And that's made all the difference. Wonderful. Well, that's a perfect segue because, of course, it takes an ADHD brain to create a mission and a business around punch needle rug hooking. <laughs> so tell us, what is it? Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> so punch needle is a textile art form that stems from the traditional North American craft of rug hooking. 
which was a method of creating a sturdy textile that was used for rugs. That started back in the 1800s and kind of continued on into the 20th century. But punch needle has now had this modern resurgence and many variations of the craft are being practiced all over the world, um, including rug tufting, which is the mechanized version of punch needle. So this is kind of having a current explosion craft space. And I discovered punch needle in 2017. I was working another full-time job and doing some of my creative work on the side. I was already living out here in Los Angeles. And I saw this technique on probably on Instagram or Pinterest or something and thought that it was a really interesting textile. And I recognized it from rugs in New back in New England because this was a craft that had been practiced back in the day in New England. And I was really excited by everything that I was seeing done with it in this kind of modern way. And so I thought that would be a really interesting technique to learn to integrate into some of my fashion pieces. And I really thought that it was just going to be a one-off, you know, I'd learn it, I'd integrate it into a coat or two, and then I would move on. And um, instead, as I learned the technique, I just got completely sucked down the rabbit hole of the history, the possibilities for it. I had so much fun with that actual creation process, creating a textile. And it led me to what I'm doing today, which is now my entire art practice is centered around Punch Needle. And I've developed a business around it and a growing community on Instagram. And I'm just so passionate about it. <laughs> so I was working with um, my AOK group yesterday. And one of the women said, I know I'm creative, but I have no creative. And she didn't even know where to even begin to start finding her creative. And we know mm -hmm. with ADHD brains, if we're not practicing our creative, any creative, right? A creative, yes. we're not going to be happy. And so my big question for you is what about punch needle rug hooking made it so satisfying to you? Mm. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, the first thing, it's interesting. Punch needle is... It's a slow craft, but it also is faster than other crafts. <laughs> I guess that's the only way I can say it. it comes together very quickly so you can really see your progress, but it also forces you to take time with each stitch. So it, it's simultaneously, I found it very calming and meditative, and I could really get into a flow with it. But the satisfaction in then seeing something both beautiful and practical and functional come out of it that you know you made with your own two hands was just so satisfying to me it's a simple so the way I, I describe it is it's a simple craft but I wouldn't say it's easy and I think there's a lot of oh it's it's really easy anyone can do it and anyone can do it it's a very simple technique there's very few kind of basic principles of it and once you master those you can do anything but it does take time and practice to actually learn how to implement those properly. And I found that once those basic techniques were mastered, I mean, my brain was just exploding with ideas of how this could be applied, not only to rugs, which is kind of what it has traditionally been used for, or now kind of artwork and wall hangings that people have been, you know, how people have been applying the craft. But from my background in fashion design, seeing all these possibilities with this as a textile for construction and to kind of apply to other areas. And it really is something that anyone can learn. And I think other folks that I know who have ADHD, who have practiced punch needle, have really found that it kind of hits on a lot of things for us, both like having something that maybe brings us a little bit into like a slower, more meditative frame of mind, but also that can allow that kind of depth of like hyper focus <laughs> uh, once you get into things. It has definitely, it's been both exciting for me professionally, obviously, but also just something that I found really rewarding personally. It actually sounds perfect for the ADHD brain if you want like a new craft, because I think about, oh my gosh, Micah, if you saw how many different needlepoint, you know, <laughs> pillars and covers and things that I've started, and I have only completed one, and that one is probably a four by four little tiny square. Yes, I just, you know, it's so fun initially to pick everything out and to start, but then it gets boring versus this sounds like once you get it, 
it's so satisfying because you can actually see it because it's done. Yes. So then you can move on to the next one. Exactly. And that's that's something that I've found kind of throughout my life, like project based things and why I think I like making things and creativity in general is that it's so project based. So you start on something, you complete it. There's that sense of satisfaction. You can move on to something new. And that's absolutely possible with Punchy Knoll. And yeah, I think that, you know, for me, is I don't know if this is resonates for you or, or other folks with ADHD, but for me, it took me a while to get started with it because I couldn't find a teacher. And there were a bunch of videos online and I was kind of getting conflicting information. And there's a lot of different tools out there, but there's actually type variations of the craft that get confused. So there's punch needle embroidery, which is actually different than punch needle rug hooking. It's similar in principle, but all the tools and materials and backing fabrics are different. So sometimes people will say, oh, well, I bought a punch needle. I bought this backing fabric, but it's not working for me. And that's because that needle is meant for a different type of fabric. And this, you know, needle is required for this type of fabric. So I really was intent on, I I always want to learn things as in depth as possible the first time. And so I really wanted a teacher in person who I could ask questions of the first time I learned. And so it took me months to find someone to teach me because this was still a very new craft at the time, kind of having this resurgence. So I finally found this teacher and was able to ask all my questions. And that is what I think set me up for success. Because I do think that if I was kind of trying to continue down the path of like the videos I was watching and the things I was buying that weren't working, it would be so easy to get frustrated and to never pick it up again. But I think it made a big difference. I know for me, that's how it's been with all of my creative projects that once I learn from like a trained instructor, (laughs) um, I find it a lot easier to stick with the craft. So what made you think, wow, I like this. Did you start working in punch needle rug hooking and think, I could make a business out of this? Or did you just start working within it? You loved it so much and one thing led to another and all of a sudden, voila, here's a business. (laughs) Yes, it definitely uh, kind of happened of its own accord. I did not get started in it thinking at all that it was even going to, you know, be something that I would integrate into my my work long term, let alone start a business around it. But as I continued my own training in the technique, basically, I both fell in love with it for my own work. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to integrate this into my my fashion work, which wasn't my full time job at the time. So I saw it as just a creative hobby, kind of something that um, a passion that maybe one day I hoped would be able to bring in some income. But it was only after I started getting a lot of questions basically on on Instagram when I started sharing my pieces and I made a coat out of punch needle. And when I shared that, it got a lot of attention and I had a lot of questions, of course. What is that technique? How do you do it? So I found that I was spending a lot more time on my uh, Instagram account answering questions about the technique and where to find the tools and how to do it. And I realized, you know, let me, I feel like there should be a separate space for me to answer these questions. Um, And at that point, I had already trained in Vermont with Amy Oxford at the Oxford Rug Hooking School and had planned to begin teaching the technique. So I thought, let me create a separate account so that I can share my knowledge with other people and keep my other account where kind of I put my artwork out there. And that's when I created Punchino World um, in late 2019 and in early 2020. um, And then, of course, when COVID hit and everyone was looking for crafts to do... Um, It just really took off. And I found I loved answering people's questions. And it was a space for me to share my knowledge and to kind of share all the experiments that I would do and the things I was finding um, in the process of my own creations. I was discovering things that then I would share with with the community. And even then, I didn't think it it wasn't really intended to be a business. It was really an online Instagram community. I would, you know, support others and share photos of other people's work so that people could kind of see what other people were doing with it and get inspired. And at the time, my role was just to direct people to other places where they could purchase the supplies and and learn the craft. But as time went on, it's just such a small niche craft that there aren't a lot of places that are selling the supplies. It's there were very few few companies and some online Etsy shops selling supplies that were, you know, sometimes I'd recommend a place to my followers on Instagram and 
maybe these items would be sold out on their Etsy shop and they wouldn't know when they would be restocked. And so I would get all these questions. And at some point I realized that in order to best address the needs of the community that I was building, I had to make it as easy as possible for them to gain access to the the tools and materials and the education. So I recorded an online course. Also during COVID, I realized, you know, my plan to teach in-person classes wasn't going to be happening for the foreseeable future. Um, so that's when I recorded my first online course at Punch Needle Academy, which is the kind of school uh, that I have under Punch Needle World. And so I recorded that foundation course and that allowed people to get the experience of a full, you know, four or five hour class in learning punch needle, but they could do it at home on their own time. And from there, that's when I realized I had to start selling the, the tools and materials. And just last year, at the end of last year in 2022, we just launched our own line of grip strip frames and backing fabric um, and frame covers and are about to launch a yarn line as well um, to make rug wool more accessible to folks. So it really was just a a process of one thing following another and kind of realizing, well, this is what people need at this time from me. And okay, now that I'm giving them this information, now they're asking about the supplies and here's how I can give them the supplies. So it's been a really, really natural evolution with Punching So, World. So did you say that you started a line for young people? Um, a yarn line. Oh, um, yarn and, line. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, you, need a, you need a young people line too. Yeah. Well, yeah, hopefully it's, it's, for young young <laughs> it's for everyone, young and old. Yeah. <laughs> the whole line. I remember. I mean, as a kid, I was so crafty. It was just all yeah. about, you know, whatever new craft I could learn. Oh, it just, well, we now know why right, dopamine and positive emotion. That's what it yes, is. Absolutely. Um, so I want to make a comment because I, you know, your aesthetic is so beautiful and I'm so attracted to that. You know, when I look on Instagram and that's how I, you had sent me an email, but then I went on your Instagram and I'm like, oh my God, this is everything she does is so beautiful. And um, so I really encourage people to go to your Instagram, which is punchneedle.world. So you're an artist, you're an entrepreneur. Yes. How much of being an artist and an entrepreneur do you think is tied to having a neurodivergent ADHD brain? Oh, I think I think all of it. <laughs> For me, in, in my case, I really, uh, once again, kind of having gotten that diagnosis, so many things clicked into place for me, understanding myself, understanding my creativity, my kind of endless supply of new ideas and the desire to constantly be doing new things. And I, yeah, I credit, I credit so much of that to my ADHD now. And I really, I've come to embrace that as a big driver of both my creativity and the desire to, to work for myself <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and start my own company and business. And I think that drive to be able to pursue the things that I'm interested in because I know that that's when I do my best work has, has been present for me for a long time since college, for sure. So I'm curious, did you have other businesses, you know, starting back when you were a child or was this your first entrepreneurial venture? Yeah, I did. I, I actually, that's funny. Starting from when I was a child, I had a little business in when I was in like seventh or eighth grade where I made sea glass earrings. I would find like sea glass on the beach in Rhode Island. And I was always very creative as a child and making things. And so I developed this way of kind of wrapping wire around the sea glass and adding beads. And I would create these earrings. And they actually sold in a, a little store locally in Rhode Island for many years. And it's funny, even though I, I had stopped doing that, I think in early high school, I remember one time coming home from college and uh, my mom was like, oh, you have like your final check, like the final pieces sold that were in this store from like when I was young. So, you know, early, those kind of entrepreneurial uh, creative adventures. And then I've always had like a side business on the side of every job I've had. So in, you know, my 20s, when I had more corporate jobs, I had an Etsy business making handmade paper stitched collage greeting cards. And um, I was doing fashion collections on the side. And and then after I left that job, I, I founded a company with a friend of mine 
that was an online wedding registry, but for experiences instead of things. Stuff. And yeah, yeah. And, and we would partner with local businesses to kind of curate unique experiences. So it was a little different, but that never quite got off the ground. I did that for a few years. I even did it full time for for a year and a half. Um, but both the launching and kind of the funding and the money we needed to keep that going never really materialized. So we shut that down. So I've kind of had these small like starts here and there and whether it's been a side hobby business or whether it was kind of an you know an enterprise like the wedding registry I feel like I've I've been able to start a lot of things but never really take anything to the next level and I think that was also why one Harrison brought up the possibility of ADHD and I started reading about it it came at a time when you know I had been working on punch needle for a few years I had all these ideas for it and it just felt like I wasn't sure that I was doing it very effectively. And I I kind of was starting to get down really for, for the first time, starting to get down on myself about, you know, what what's wrong with me? I know this is a good idea. I, I know all the information to make it a reality. I see all the steps and the big picture, but I don't know how to like harness it all. And so that was something that really that resonated with me and that um I'm I'm still working on. <laughs> I think um, asking for help is a big one in that, and I'm I'm definitely still working on the I don't need to do it all myself. I but think that's yeah, that's been a big piece. <laughs> I think Micah too that this is exactly why it was so important to get diagnosed mm. because when we feel like we're all over the place and why can't we do this, you know, in a linear fashion like everybody else. But then we get diagnosed and we understand how our brains actually work. Then, as you mentioned, you can put into place different kinds of schedules, different kinds of work habits, whatever systems that work for you. Right. Yes. Absolutely. And then you can keep going and you can make, you know, these brilliant ideas that you have actually successful as far as, you know, that they can pay the bills, that you can make a living at them which is what we need to do in order to be happy, right? We need to be in that creative, constantly building. So you had alluded to these new strategies that you started to put in place. You said schedules and work habits. I'm curious, can you share some of them with us? Yeah, so some of the habits that I've put into place start actually with kind of how I've structured my day. And the first one being that I I wake up earlier and I use a lot of alarms, (laughs) my to-do list, which I've always used, but instead I kind of structure my day so that my mornings now are a time when I'm able to focus on certain things for me that in the past I would kind of dive right into work and then I would kind of have other ideas throughout the day that would distract me and I would kind of get pulled away and go down a rabbit hole of something else. And instead starting off with, okay, you know, if I know that I'm, when my brain is kind of going with ideas, I need to allow myself that space in the morning whether it's through free writing or just kind of free planning and thinking about whatever it is that's just on my mind when I wake up. And kind of like I I found, because I've also kept journals throughout my life, and when I write things down and get things out of my brain, it doesn't kind of jumble around in there throughout the day. So it seems so simple. Um, And again, I've journaled for a long time, but kind of saying, no, if that works to get these things out of my brain, I need to start my days with that and building in more physical activity that's also you know looking i think looking back at some of those childhood coping mechanisms also allowed me to say well what if it worked for me then maybe there's certain things that will work for me now um and sports were a big part of my life growing up i know that when i physically exhaust myself i also exhaust my brain to the point that it i can actually focus <laughs> and i'm yeah. not so kind of hyperactive all over the place So I think my morning routine was a big part of it. My to-do list and my schedule um, and really understanding when I need to kind of not schedule meetings or calls um, and and giving myself dedicated time to work, saying no to more things and and now having that frame of reference to do that. It's like, okay, this is what is going to be best for my brain and my work instead of just, you know, we all know, say no to things and, and get things done. But I think I was so much better able to implement a lot of these strategies that I knew of or that we hear about when I understood how it actually fit with with the way my brain worked. Brilliant. 
Absolutely. Makes so much sense. So what are the ADHD traits that you feel are responsible for your success? Uh, I think one of the big ones is that I, I'm i rarely bored <laughs> and I don't run out of ideas. <laughs> I have too many ideas. Um, and I think that um, that influx of ideas and creativity is something that has definitely contributed to my success as a creative and an entrepreneur and also just being open to experiences and people. Um, I really love meeting new people and having new conversations and learning new things and learning what makes other people tick. And I think that that has just, it's, it's only a, a positive, you know? And I think that, again, further embracing that and celebrating that, I love that about myself and my ADHD. And um, I really think that it's, it's helped me in ways that I hadn't even you know, realized throughout my life. Do you have a number one ADHD workaround that you kind of always fall on? Oh, I mean, for me, honestly, it's it's my to do list. <laughs> that's uh, that's what keeps me on track, and I spend a lot of time kind of organizing myself. And I've I've learned that as much as I hate structure when it comes from outside, I really, really do work best when I. Uh, give myself kind of a container and a space to play within. Um, so that for me has been the biggest uh, workaround, actually, which is just being OK with saying this. I'm going to follow, you know, Monday through Friday. I have my routine and embracing that has has really helped me. You know, that is really key. What you said that structure when it comes from outside, we're going to balk at that. But yes. if we can be the ones to set up a structure for ourselves that works, we will be successful every time. Yes, that that's a really, really good way that you phrase that. So, Micah, where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? To learn more about the work that I do, you can see my work on my website at www.micahclaspertorch.com or on Instagram at claspertorch. If you're curious about Punch Needle, I recommend checking out Punch Needle World at punchneedleworld.com or on Instagram at punchneedle.world. And if your listeners are interested in learning Punch Needle, I am offering 20% off my online course at punchneedleacademy.com for your listeners using the code ADHD podcast. And that will get them 20% off the online course. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Micah. And thank you also for spending time with us here today. It was lovely to get to know you. Thank you, Tracy. It was a pleasure. Before I leave you, just a quick reminder, the doors for our spring, your ADHD brain is AOKR open. And if you want to save $100, use the code SPRING2023. You can go to tracyotsuka.com forward slash AOK for more information. Again, I would love to have you join us. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Micah, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart-ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyotsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week. <laughs>